grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My dear fellow heirs of heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? At the appointed hour of the day, millions of children would sit themselves in front of the television set and be invited into Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. For 60 seconds in the typical beginning of each episode, Fred Rogers would sing that little song. And in that brief 60 seconds, he would use the word neighbor or some form of it eight times. Children were invited to come into a, a neighborhood where they mattered, where adults would take time to listen to them, talk with them, teach them, spend time with them. And everybody was a neighbor. Mr. McFeely, the delivery man, neighbor Abner, and Officer Clemens. They were all neighbors, including each and every child on the other end of the television. In our text this morning, Jesus is asked a question, who is my neighbor? It was asked by a teacher of the law, a religious teacher. He was kind of uncomfortable with Jesus' teachings about loving everybody. And so he wanted some clarification. Kind of sounds like some conversations today, doesn't it? Who are we to love? Who really is my neighbor? Now, the Bible teaches two simple commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. That comes from the book of Deuteronomy. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's from the book of Leviticus. But this skeptic wanted more. And so he asks, well, who is my neighbor? Now that sounds kind of like a pretty silly question to us, doesn't it? I mean, we all know, we grew up with, Mr. some of us grew up with Mr. Rogers. We know who our neighbors are. And yet for a first century Jew, that was an important distinction. Because the Jewish religious teachers, the rabbis and the teachers of the law, taught that your neighbor is a relative, a friend, somebody you like, a person in your religious circle, or somebody from your own nation. And so if somebody was a Gentile, a pagan, or somebody you didn't like very much, then they weren't your neighbors, and you could treat them as terribly as you want, and God was okay with that. That's kind of sounds familiar too today, doesn't it? You know, the people that talk about being so tolerant of other people's opinions or ideas or lifestyles, or they are so accepting of other people's ideas until you disagree with them, and then all of a sudden they get rather vehemently angry with you for being so intolerant of their tolerance, right? And so Jesus answers a man's question, like Jesus typically does, with a story, the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus was really pushing the man's buttons here because he was showing this man the prejudice that was within him and the lovelessness of his own heart. And then Jesus concludes that story by saying, go and do likewise. 
go and do the same thing. And with that simple little phrase, Jesus is turning that whole question around, isn't it? Because the question, well, who is my neighbor, isn't it a question of exclusion? Of who is or who isn't? Who deserves to be loved by me or who doesn't deserve to be loved by me? Who's in and who's out? But Jesus turns it around and, it's, and he says, it isn't a question of who is your neighbor, but it's a question of are you a neighbor to everybody around you? That sounds a lot like Mr. Rogers, doesn't it? Friend, uh, being a neighbor is not who you are. It's what you do. As Christians living in this world, this is our neighborhood. Everyone is our neighbor. But as we live in this world, we also need to remember that we are members of another kind of neighborhood. A neighborhood where all children are welcome. A neighborhood where our Father takes time to talk with us and listen to us and teach us. A neighborhood where everyone is redeemed and restored and forgiven. It's God's neighborhood. Or as Jesus would call it, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And we are privileged to live in that neighborhood and share that neighborhood with the people around us, finding others who are wounded and broken and beaten by this very brutal world that we live in. Love God and love others. Pretty simple, isn't it? And it really is. This is the way God intended life to be. This is the way he created us to be. And it's a privilege to be able to live that way with just those two guiding principles, love God and love others. And as, as I try and live my life by those principles, and that means that they govern my words and my actions and my thoughts and my attitudes, I realize I need a new heart. Don't you? Because those two principles don't always guide my words, my actions, my attitudes. And I'd suspect they don't always guide yours either. We become selfish instead of selfless. We look inward instead of outward. And we get so wrapped up in ourselves and in who belongs and who doesn't belong, we forget who we belong to, who we are. So I need a new heart. Because that's really where it starts, doesn't it? It starts in our hearts and it migrates to our brains. And our brains then change our attitudes, which then change our words and actions, the things that I say, the things I choose not to say, the things I do or the things I choose not to do. Love God and love others. It's simple to say those words, but it's a lot harder, isn't it, to live those words. But that's what the Christian life is about. That is what the Christian, uh, the, this life that we are given, this neighborhood that we are placed in is to be given or to be all about. And we find that as we try and, and live that discipleship life. 
And the more and more we try and live it, it, it takes dedication. It's tough. It's tough loving others, all others, loving your enemies, not cursing those who curse you, not resenting and retaliating against those who hurt you. That's tough. And we find it takes dedication and repentance and rededication and more repentance. And we need that heart of love because the more we work at it, the more we realize that we can't, this kind of love does not come from us. The more I try and be loving, the more I realize that that kind of love isn't created by me. It comes as a gift a gift of grace from the greatest lover of all times, Jesus Christ. He was the greatest neighbor, wasn't he? He loved to listen to his heavenly Father and carry out his heavenly Father's will. He loved to, to spend time with the people around him, to talk with them, to listen to them, to teach them, to feed the multitudes, to cure their diseases, to, to rescue sinking disciples. And even as he hung on the cross, Jesus was a good neighbor, wasn't he? Forgiving the soldiers who were crucifying him, assuring that thief who was mocking him, comforting his mother who was going to miss him, and redeeming a world that rejected him. That's the kind of love that Jesus pours into our hearts through baptism. In baptism, our hearts of, of selfishness and unneighborliness are removed by God's grace, and a new heart, God's heart, is implanted within us, full of that love for every single person. And now those commandments make sense to us. Now we want to keep those commandments. And as a good neighbor, Jesus keeps pouring that love into us again and again, renewing it, refreshing it, and strengthening it through the Word and through the sacraments. For there He gives us that kind of neighborly love, reminding us that as we commune together, this is a neighborhood, a neighborhood, a community of faith brought together by Him. But it's a neighborhood, a community of faith where we are equipped and strengthened then to go out into the world and find those others who are beaten and laying by the wayside, who are wondering where anybody is that cares about them and show them and invite them and bring them in to our neighborhood, to God's neighborhood. See, that's what Jesus does again and again to us. Every time we fail, every time we falter, every time we are broken and beaten on the side of the road from this world, He comes to us and He pours the, the healing sa uh, uh, oil and salve of the gospel on our wounds. He binds up our brokenness with the strips of cloth ripped from His own holy and precious robes. And he says, come back. Won't you be my neighbor? And we are so full of joy, so refreshed. See, being a neighbor isn't your mission. It's not a mission for you to fulfill. It's a relationship to cultivate. Now thinking of it that way, how does that change your actions? 
that it isn't just something to do to be able to check off your list, but it's a relationship to foster and to, to encourage and to build. What kind of a neighbor are you? I'd like you to make a list of all the people you know. And people you know in three main neighborhoods. Your social neighborhood, those are the people you hang out with, have fun with, that kind of thing. Your geographical neighborhood, that's where you live and the people who live around you. And then your public neighborhood, that's work or school or whatever else. List the people, their names. And if it's somebody whose name you don't know, then write a description. It's the lady at the gym, or it's the guy with a horrible slice on the golf course. And then ask yourself, what do I need to do to be a neighbor to this person? What does that change in your actions? How and what would you do to invite them in to not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, but God's neighborhood? so that they find a place, so that they find a place to know that they belong where somebody listens, somebody cares, somebody blesses, somebody has saved them. Won't you be their neighbor? Amen. Please stand.